In his books were found marked passages corresponding to the notes taken from the girl's ravings. Her subconscious memory had stored up the sounds of these passages heard in her early youth, but of which she had no recollection in her normal state. Beaufort, describing his sensations just before being rescued from drowning, says, Every incident of my former life seemed to glance across my recollection in a retrograde procession, not in mere outline, but in a picture filled with every minute and collateral feature, thus forming a panoramic view of my whole existence. K. truly observes, by adopting the opinion that every thought or impression that had once been consciously before the mind is ever afterwards retained, we obtain light on many obscure mental phenomena, and especially do we draw from it the conclusion of the perfectibility of the memory to an almost unlimited extent. We cannot doubt that, could we penetrate to the lowest depths of our mental nature, we should there find traces of every impression we have received, every thought we have entertained, and every act we have done through our past life each one making its influence felt in the way of building up our present knowledge or in guiding our everyday actions. And if they persist in the mind, might it not be possible to recall most, if not all of them, into consciousness when we wish to do so, if our memories or powers of recollection were what they should be? As we have said, this great subconscious region of the mind, this memory region, may be thought of as a great record file, with an intricate system of indexes and office boys whose business it is to file away the records, to index them, and to find them when needed. The records record only what we have impressed upon them by the attention, the degree of depth and clearness, depending entirely upon the degree of attention which we bestowed upon the original impression. We can never expect to have the office boys of the memory bring up anything that they have not been given to file away. The indexing and cross-references are supplied by the association existing between the various impressions. The more cross-references or associations that are connected with an idea, thought, or impression that is filed away in the memory, the greater the chances of it being found readily when wanted. These two features of attention and association, and the parts they play in the phenomena of memory, are mentioned in detail in other chapters of this book. These little office boys of the memory are an industrious and willing lot of little chaps, but like all boys, they do their best work when kept in practice. Idleness and lack of exercise cause them to become slothful and careless, and forgetful of the records under their charge. A little fresh exercise and work soon take the cobwebs out of the brains, and they spring eagerly to their tasks. They become familiar with their work when exercised properly, and soon become very expert. They have a tendency to remember on their own part, and when a certain record is called for, often they grow accustomed to its place and can find it without referring to the indexes at all. But their trouble comes from faint and almost illegible records caused by poor attention. These they can scarcely decipher when they do succeed in finding them. Lack of proper indexing by associations causes them much worry and extra work, and sometimes they are unable to find the records at all from this neglect. Often, however, after they have told you that they cannot find a thing, and you have left the place in disgust, they will continue their search, and hours afterward, will surprise you by handing you the desired idea or impression which they had found carelessly indexed or improperly filed away. In these chapters you will be helped, if you will carry in your mind these little office boys of the memory record file, and the hard work they have to do for you, 
much of which is made doubly burdensome by your own neglect and carelessness. Treat these little fellows right, and they will work overtime for you, willingly and joyfully. But they need your assistance and encouragement, and an occasional word of praise and commendation. End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of Memory: How to Develop, Train, and Use It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory: How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter Six: Attention. As we have seen in the preceding chapters, before one can expect to recall or remember a thing, that thing must have been impressed upon the records of his subconsciousness, distinctly and clearly, and the main factor of the recording of impressions is that quality of the mind that we call attention. All the leading authorities on the subject of memory recognize and teach the value of attention in the cultivation and development of the memory. Tupper says, Memory, the daughter of attention, is the teeming mother of wisdom. Lowell says, Attention is the stuff that memory is made of, and memory is accumulated genius. Hall says, In the power of fixing the attention lies the most precious of the intellectual habits. Locke says, When the ideas that offer themselves are taken notice of, and, as it were, registered in the memory, it is attention. Stewart says, The permanence of the impression which anything leaves on the memory is proportionate to the degree of attention which was originally given to it. Thompson says, The experiences most permanently impressed upon consciousness are those upon which the greatest amount of attention has been fixed. Beatty says, the force wherewith anything strikes the mind is generally in proportion to the degree of attention bestowed upon it. The great art of memory is attention. Inattentive people have always bad memories. K says, It is generally held by philosophers that without some degree of attention no impression of any duration could be made on the mind or laid up in the memory. Hamilton says, It is a law of the mind that the intensity of the present consciousness determines the vivacity of the future memory. Memory and consciousness are thus in the direct ratio of each other. Vivid consciousness, long memory. Faint consciousness, short memory. No consciousness, no memory. An act of attention, that is an act of concentration, seems thus necessary to every exertion of consciousness, as a certain contraction of the pupil is requisite to every exertion of vision. Attention, then, is to consciousness what the contraction of the pupil is to sight, or to the eye of the mind what the microscope or telescope is to the bodily eye. It constitutes the better half of all intellectual power. We have quoted from the above authorities at considerable length for the purpose of impressing upon your mind the importance of this subject of attention. The subconscious regions of the mind are the great storehouses of the mental records of impressions from within and without. Its great system of filing, recording, and indexing these records constitute that which we call memory. But before any of this work is possible, impressions must first have been received. And, as you may see from the quotations just given, these impressions depend upon the power of attention given to the things making the impressions. If there has been given great attention, there will be clear and deep impressions. If there has been given but average attention, there will be but average impressions. If there has been given but faint attention, there will be but faint impressions. If there has been given no attention, there will be no records.
One of the most common causes of poor attention is to be found in the lack of interest. We are apt to remember the things in which we have been most interested because in that outpouring of interest there has been a high degree of attention manifested. A man may have a very poor memory for many things, but when it comes to the things in which his interest is involved, he often remembers the most minute details. What is called involuntary attention is that form of attention that follows upon interest, curiosity, or desire. No special effort of the will being required in it. What is called voluntary attention is that form of attention that is bestowed upon objects not necessarily interesting, curious, or attractive. This requires the application of the will and is a mark of a developed character. Every person has more or less involuntary attention while but few possess developed voluntary attention. The former is instinctive, the latter comes only by practice and training. But there is this important point to be remembered, that interest may be developed by voluntary attention bestowed and held upon an object. Things that are originally lacking in sufficient interest to attract the involuntary attention may develop a secondary interest if the voluntary attention be placed upon and held upon them. As Halleck says on this point, when it is said that attention will not take a firm hold on an uninteresting thing, we must not forget that anyone not shallow and fickle can soon discover something interesting in most objects. Here cultivated minds show their special superiority, for the attention which they are able to give generally ends in finding a pearl in the most uninteresting looking oyster. When an object necessarily loses interest from one point of view, such minds discover in it new attributes. The essence of genius is to present an old thing in new ways, whether it be some force in nature or some aspect of humanity. It is very difficult to teach another person how to cultivate the attention. This because the whole thing consists so largely in the use of the will and by faithful practice and persistent application. The first requisite is the determination to use the will. You must argue it out with yourself until you become convinced that it is necessary and desirable for you to acquire the art of voluntary attention. You must convince yourself beyond reasonable doubt. This is the first step and one more difficult than it would seem at first sight. The principal difficulty in it lies in the fact that to do the thing you must do some active, earnest thinking, and the majority of people are too lazy to indulge in such mental effort. Having mastered this first step, you must induce a strong burning desire to acquire the art of voluntary attention. You must learn to want it hard. In this way, you induce a condition of interest and attractiveness where it was previously lacking. Third and last, you must hold your will firmly and persistently to the task and practice faithfully. Begin by turning your attention upon some uninteresting thing and studying its detail until you are able to describe them. This will prove very tiresome at first but you must stick to it. Do not practice too long at a time at first. Take a rest and try it again later. You will soon find that it comes easier and that a new interest is beginning to manifest itself in the task. Examine this book as practice. Learn how many pages there are in it, how many chapters, how many pages in each chapter, the details of type, printing and binding, all the little things about it, so that you could give another person a full account of the minor details of the book. This may seem uninteresting, and so it will be at first, but a little practice will create a new interest in the petty details, 
and you will be surprised at the number of little things that you will notice. This plan, practiced on many things in spare hours, will develop the power of voluntary attention and perception in anyone, no matter how deficient he may have been in these things. If you can get someone else to join in the game task with you, and then each endeavor to excel the other in finding details, the task will be much easier and better work will be accomplished. Begin to take notice of things about you, the places you visit, the things in the rooms, etc. In this way, you will start the habit of noticing things, which is the first requisite for memory development. Halleck gives the following excellent advice on this subject. To look at a thing intelligently is the most difficult of all arts. The first rule for the cultivation of accurate perception is do not try to perceive the whole of a complex object at once. Take the human face as an example. A man holding an important position to which he has been elected offended many people because he could not remember faces and hence failed to recognize individuals the second time he met them. His trouble was in looking at the countenance as a whole. When he changed his method of observation and noticed carefully the nose, mouth, eyes, chin, and color of hair, he at once began to find recognition easier. He was no longer in difficulty of mistaking A for B, since he remembered that the shape of B's nose was different, or the color of his hair at least three shades lighter. This example shows that another rule can be formulated. Pay careful attention to details. We are perhaps asked to give a minute description of the exterior of a somewhat noted suburban house that we have lately seen. We reply in general terms, giving the size and color of the house. Perhaps we also have an idea of part of the material used in the exterior construction. We are asked to be exact about the shape of the door, porch, roof, chimneys, and windows whether the windows are plain or circular, whether they have cornices, or whether the trimmings around them are of the same material as the rest of the house. A friend, who will be unable to see the house, wishes to know definitely about the angles of the roof and the way the windows are arranged with reference to them. Unless we can answer these questions exactly, we merely tantalize our friends by telling them we have seen the house. To see an object merely as an undiscriminated mass of something in a certain place is to do no more than a donkey accomplishes as he trots along. There are three general rules that may be given in this matter of bestowing the voluntary attention in the direction of actually seeing things instead of merely looking at them. The first is, make yourself take an interest in the thing. The second, see it as if you were taking note of it in order to repeat its details to a friend. This will force you to take notice. The third, give to your subconscious a mental command to take note of what you are looking at. Say to it, here, you take note of this and remember it for me. This last consists of a peculiar knack that can be attained by a little practice. It will come to you suddenly after a few trials. Regarding this third rule whereby the subconscious is made to work for you, Charles Leland has the following to say, although he uses it to illustrate another point. As I understand it, it is a kind of impulse or projection of will into the coming work. I may here illustrate this with a curious fact in physics. If the reader wished to ring a doorbell so as to produce as much sound as possible, he would probably pull it as far back as he could and then let it go. But if he would, in letting it go, simply give it a tap with his forefinger, 
he would actually redouble the sound. Or, to shoot an arrow as far as possible, it is not enough to merely draw the bow to its utmost span or tension. If, just as it goes, you will give the bow a quick push, though the effort be trifling, the arrow will fly almost as far again as it would have done without it. Or if, as is well known in wielding a very sharp saber, we make the draw cut, that is, if to blow or chop, as with an axe, we also add a certain slight pull simultaneously, we can cut through a silk handkerchief or a sheep. Forethought, command to the subconsciousness, is the tap on the bell, the push on the bow, the draw on the saber. It is the deliberate but yet rapid action of the mind when before dismissing thought, we bid the mind to consequently respond. It is more than merely thinking what we are to do. It is the bidding or ordering the self to fulfill a task before willing it. Remember first, last, and always that before you can remember or recollect, you must first perceive. And that perception is possible only through attention and responds in degree to the latter. Therefore, it has truly been said that the great art of memory is attention. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of Memory – How to Develop, Train, and Use It – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory – How to Develop, Train, and Use It – by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 7 – Association In the preceding chapters, we have seen that in order that a thing may be remembered, it must be impressed clearly upon the mind in the first place, and that in order to obtain a clear impression, there must be a manifestation of attention. So much for the recording of the impressions. But when we come to recalling, recollecting, or remembering the impressions, we are brought face to face with another important law of memory, the law of association. Association plays a part analogous to the indexing and cross-indexing of a book, a library, or another system in which the aim is to readily find something that has been filed away or contained in some way in a collection of similar things. As Kay says, in order that what is in the memory may be recalled or brought again before consciousness, it is necessary that it be regarded in connection or in association with one or more other things or ideas, and as a rule, the greater the number of other things with which it is associated, the greater the likelihood of its recall. The two processes are involved in every act of memory. We must first impress, and then we must associate. Without a clear impression being formed, that which is recalled will be indistinct and inaccurate, and unless it is associated with something else in the mind, it cannot be recalled. If we may suppose an idea existing in the mind by itself, unconnected with any other idea, its recall would be impossible. All the best authorities recognize and teach the importance of this law of association in connection with the memory. Abercrombie says, Next to the effect of attention is the remarkable influence produced upon memory by association. Carpenter says, The recording power of memory mainly depends upon the degree of attention we give to the idea to be remembered. The reproducing power again altogether depends upon the nature of the associations by which the new idea has been linked on to other ideas which have been previously recorded. Ribo says, The most fundamental law which regulates psychological phenomena is the law of association. In its comprehensive character, it is comparable to the law of attraction in the physical world. 
Mill says, That which the law of gravitation is to astronomy, that which the elementary properties of the tissues are to physiology, the law of association of ideas is to psychology. Stewart says, The connection between memory and the association of ideas is so striking that it has been supposed by some that the whole of the phenomena might be resolved into this principle. The association of ideas connects our various thoughts with each other so as to present them to the mind in a certain order, but it presupposes the existence of those thoughts in the mind. In other words, it presupposes a faculty of retaining the knowledge which we acquire. On the other hand, it is evident that without the associating principle, the power of retaining our thoughts and of recognizing them when they occur to us would have been of little use, for the most important articles of our knowledge might have remained latent in the mind, even when those occasions presented themselves to which they were immediately applicable. Association of ideas depends upon two principles known, respectively, as 1. The law of contiguity and 2. The law of similarity. Association by contiguity is that form of association by which an idea is linked, connected, or associated with the sensation, thought, or idea immediately preceding it, and that which directly follows it. Each idea or thought is a link in a great chain of thought being connected with the preceding link and the succeeding link. Association by similarity is that form of association by which an idea, thought, or sensation is linked, connected, or associated with ideas, thoughts, or sensations of a similar kind which have occurred previously or subsequently. The first form of association is the relation of sequence, the second the relation of kind. Association by contiguity is the great law of thought as well as of memory. As K says, the great law of mental association is that of contiguity, by means of which sensations and ideas that have been in the mind together, or in close succession, tend to unite together, or cohere in such a way that the one can afterward recall the other. The connection that naturally subsists between a sensation or idea in the mind and that which immediately preceded or followed it is of the strongest and most intimate nature. The two, strictly speaking, are but one, forming one complete thought. As Taine says, to speak correctly, there is no isolated or separate sensation. A sensation is a state which begins as a continuation of preceding ones and ends by losing itself in those following it. It is by an arbitrary severing and for the convenience of language that we set it apart as we do. Its beginning is the end of another and its ending the beginning of another. As Ribo says, when we read or hear a sentence, for example, at the commencement of the fifth word, something of the fourth word still remains. Association by contiguity may be separated into two subclasses, contiguity in time and contiguity in space. In contiguity in time, there is manifested the tendency of the memory to recall the impressions in the same order in which they were received. The first impression suggesting the second, and that the third, and so on. In this way, the child learns to repeat the alphabet, and the adult the succeeding lines of a poem. As Priestley says, in a poem, the end of each preceding word being connected with the beginning of the succeeding one, we can easily repeat them in that order, but we are not able to repeat them backwards till they have been frequently named in that order. Memory of words, or groups of words, depends upon this form of contiguous association. 
Some persons are able to repeat long poems from beginning to end with perfect ease, but are unable to repeat any particular sentence or verse without working down to it from the beginning. Contiguity in space is manifested in forms of recollection or remembrance by position. Thus, by remembering the things connected with the position of a particular thing, we are enabled to recall the thing itself. As we have seen in a preceding chapter, some forms of memory systems have been based on this law. If you will recall some house or room in which you have been, you will find that you will remember one object after another in the order of the relative positions or contiguity in space or position. Beginning with the front hall, you may travel in memory from one room to another, recalling each with the objects it contains according to the degree of attention you bestowed upon them originally. K says of association by contiguity, it is on this principle of contiguity that mnemonical systems are constructed, as when what we wish to remember is associated in the mind with a certain object or locality, the ideas associated will at once come up. Or when each word or idea is associated with the one immediately preceding it, so that when the one is recalled, the other comes up along with it and thus long lists of names or long passages of books can be readily learnt by heart. From the foregoing, it will be seen that it is of great importance that we correlate our impressions with those preceding and following. The more closely knitted together our impressions are, the more closely will they cohere and the greater will be the facility of remembering or recollecting them. We should endeavor to form our impressions of things so that they will be associated with other impressions in time and space. Every other thing that is associated in the mind with a given thing serves as a loose end of memory, which if once grasped and followed up will lead us to the thing we desire to recall to mind. Association by similarity is the linking together of impressions of a similar kind, irrespective of time and place. Carpenter expresses it as follows, The law of similarity expresses the general fact that any present state of consciousness tends to revive previous states which are similar to it. Rational or philosophical association is when a fact or statement on which the attention is fixed is associated with some fact previously known to which it has a relation, or with some object which it is calculated to illustrate. And, as K says, the similars may be widely apart in space or in time, but they are brought together and associated through their resemblance to each other. Thus, a circumstance of today may recall circumstances of a similar nature that occurred perhaps at very different times, and they will become associated together in the mind so that afterwards the presence of one will tend to recall the others. Abercrombie says of this phase of association, the habit of correct association, that is, connecting facts in the mind according to their true relations, and to the manner in which they tend to illustrate each other, is one of the principal means of improving the memory, particularly that kind of memory which is an essential quality of a cultivated mind, namely, that which is founded not upon incidental connections, but on true and important relations. As Beatty says, the more relations or likenesses that we find or can establish between objects, the more easily will the view of one lead us to recollect the rest. And, as K says, in order to fix a thing in the memory, we must associate it with something in the mind already, and the more closely that which we wish to remember resembles that with which it is associated, 
the better it is fixed in the memory, and the more readily it is recalled. If the two strongly resemble each other, or are not to be distinguished from each other, then the association is of the strongest kind. The memory is able to retain and replace a vastly greater number of ideas, if they are associated or arranged in some principle of similarity, than if they are presented merely as isolated facts. It is not by the multitude of ideas, but the want of arrangement among them, that the memory is burdened and its powers weakened. As Arnott says, the ignorant man may be said to have charged his hundred hooks of knowledge, to use a rude simile, with single objects, while the informed man makes each hook support a long chain to which thousands of kindred and useful things are attached. We ask each student of this book to acquaint himself with a general idea of the working features of the law of association as given in this chapter for the reason that much of the instruction to be given under the head of the several phases and classes of memory is based upon an application of the law of association in connection with the law of attention. These fundamental principles should be clearly grasped before one proceeds to the details of practice and exercise. One should know not only how to use the mind and memory in certain ways, but also why it is to be used in that particular way. By understanding the reason of it, one is better able to follow out the directions. End of chapter 7。Chapter 8 of Memory How to Develop, Train, and Use It。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 8 Phases of Memory. One of the first things apt to be noticed by the student of memory is the fact that there are several different phases of the manifestation of memory. That is to say, that there are several general classes into which the phenomena of memory may be grouped. And accordingly we find some persons quite highly developed in certain phases of memory and quite deficient in others. If there were but one phase or class of memory, then a person who had developed his memory along any particular line would have at the same time developed it equally along all the other lines. But this is far from being the true state of affairs. We find men who are quite proficient in recalling the impression of faces while they find it very difficult to recall the names of the persons whose faces they remember. Others can remember faces and not names. Others have an excellent recollection of localities, while others are constantly losing themselves. Others remember dates, prices, numbers, and figures generally, while deficient in other forms of recollection. Others remember tales, incidents, anecdotes, etc., while forgetting other things. And so on, each person being apt to possess a memory good in some phases, while deficient in others. The phases of memory may be divided into two general classes, namely, one, memory of sense impressions, and two, memory of ideas. This classification is somewhat arbitrary, for the reason that sense impressions develop into ideas, and ideas are composed to a considerable extent of sense impressions, but in a general way, the classification serves its purpose, which is the grouping together of certain phases of the phenomena of memory. Memory of sense impressions, of course, includes the impressions received from all of the five senses – sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. But when we come down to a practical examination of sense impressions retained in the memory, we find that the majority of such impressions are those obtained through the two respective senses of sight and hearing. 
The impressions received from the sense of taste, touch, and smell, respectively, are comparatively small, except in the cases of certain experts in special lines, whose occupation consists in acquiring a very delicate sense of taste, smell, or touch, and correspondingly, a fine sense of memory along these particular lines. For instance, the wine taster and tea tasters, who are able to distinguish between the various grades of merchandise handled by them, have developed not only very fine senses of taste and smell, but also a remarkable memory of the impressions previously received, the power of discrimination depending as much upon the memory as upon the special sense. In the same way, the skilled surgeon as well as the skilled mechanic acquires a fine sense of touch and a correspondingly highly developed memory of touch impressions. But, as we have said, the greater part of the sense impressions stored away in our memories are those previously received through the sense of sight and hearing, respectively. The majority of sense impressions stored away in the memory have been received more or less involuntarily, that is, with the application of but a slight degree of attention. They are more or less indistinct and hazy, and are recalled with difficulty, the remembrance of them generally coming about without conscious effort, according to the law of association. That is, they come principally when we are thinking about something else upon which we have given thought and attention, and with which they have been associated. There is quite a difference between the remembrance of sense impressions received in this way and those which we record by the bestowal of attention, interest, and concentration. The sense impressions of sight are by far the most numerous in our subconscious storehouse. We are constantly exercising our sense of sight and receiving thousands of different sight impressions every hour but the majority of these impressions are but faintly recorded upon the memory because we give to them but little attention or interest. But it is astonishing at times when we find that when we recall some important event or incident, we also recall many faint sight impressions of which we did not dream we had any record. To realize the important part played by sight impressions in the phenomena of memory, Recall some particular time or event in your life and see how many more things that you saw are remembered compared with the number of things that you heard or tasted or felt or smelled. Second in number, however, are the impressions received through the sense of hearing and consequently the memory stores away a great number of sound impressions. In some cases, the impressions of sight and sound are joined together, as for instance in the case of words, in which not only the sound but the shape of the letters composing the word, or rather the word shape itself, are stored away together, and consequently are far more readily remembered or recollected than things of which but one sense impression is recorded. Teachers of memory use this fact as a means of helping their students to memorize words by speaking them aloud and then writing them down. Many persons memorize names in this way, the impression of the written word being added to the impression of the sound, thus doubling the record. The more impressions that you can make regarding a thing, the greater are the chances of your easily recollecting it. Likewise, it is very important to attach an impression of a weaker sense to that of a stronger one in order that the former may be memorized. For instance, if you have a good eye memory and a poor ear memory, it is well to attach your sound impressions to the sight impressions. And if you have a poor eye memory and a good ear memory, it is important to attach your sight impressions to your sound impressions. In this way, you take advantage of the law of association of which we have told you. Under the subclass of sight impressions are found the smaller divisions of memory known as memory of locality, memory of figures, memory of form, memory of color, 
and memory of written or printed words. Under the subclass of sound impressions are found the smaller divisions of memory known as memory of spoken words, memory of names, memory of stories, memory of music, etc. We shall pay special attention to these forms of memory in succeeding chapters. The second general class of memory, memory of ideas, includes the memory of facts, events, thoughts, lines of reasoning, etc., and is regarded as higher in the scale than the memory of sense impressions, although not more necessary nor useful to the average person. This form of memory, of course, accompanies the higher lines of intellectual effort and activities, and constitutes a large part of what is known as true education, that is, education which teaches one to think instead of to merely memorize certain things taught in books or lectures. The well-rounded man, mentally, is he who has developed his memory on all sides, rather than the one who has developed but one special phase of the faculty. It is true that a man's interest and occupation certainly tend to develop his memory according to his daily needs and requirements, but it is well that he should give to the other parts of his memory field some exercise, in order that he may not grow one-sided. As Halleck has said, many persons think that memory is mainly due to sight, but we have as many different kinds of memory as we have senses. To sight, the watermelon is a long, greenish body, but this is its least important quality. Sight alone gives the poorest idea of the watermelon. We approach the vine where the fruit is growing, and in order to decide whether it is ripe, we tap the rind and judge by the sound. We must remember that a ripe watermelon has a certain resonance. By passing our hands over the melon, we learn that it has certain touch characteristics. We cut it open and learn the qualities of taste and smell. All this knowledge afforded by the different senses must enter into a perfected memory image. Hence we see that many complex processes go to form an idea of a thing. Napoleon was not content with only hearing a name. He wrote it down, and having satisfied his eye memory as well as his ear memory, he threw the paper away. In this book we shall point out the methods and processes calculated to round out the memory of the student. As a rule, his strong phases of memory need but little attention, although even in these a little scientific knowledge will be of use. But in the weaker phases, those phases in which his memory is poor, he should exert a new energy and activity, to the end that these weaker regions of the memory may be cultivated and fertilized, and well stored with the seed impressions, which will bear a good crop in time. There is no phase, field, or class of memory that is not capable of being highly developed by intelligent application. It requires practice, exercise, and work, but the reward is great. Many a man is handicapped by being deficient in certain phases of memory, while proficient in others. The remedy is in his own hands, and we feel that in this book we have given to each the means whereby he may acquire a good memory along any or all lines. End of chapter 8、Chapter、9 9 Training the Eye Before the memory can be stored with sight impressions, before the mind can recollect or remember such impressions, the eye must be used under the direction of the attention. We think that we see things when we look at them, but in reality we see but few things, in the sense of registering clear and distinct impressions of them 
upon the tablets of the subconscious mind. We look at them rather than see them. Halleck says regarding this sight without seeing idea, a body may be imaged on the retina without ensuring perception. There must be an effort to concentrate the attention upon the many things which the world presents to our senses. A man once said to the pupils of a large school, all of whom had seen cows, I should like to find out how many of you know whether a cow's ears are above, below, behind, or in front of her horns. I want only those pupils to raise their hands who are sure about the position and who will promise to give a dollar to charity if they answer wrong. Only two hands were raised. Their owners had drawn cows and in order to do that had been forced to concentrate their attention upon the animals. Fifteen pupils were sure that they had seen cats climb trees and descend them. There was unanimity of opinion that the cats went up heads first. When asked whether the cats came down head or tail first, the majority were sure that the cats descended as they were never known to do. Anyone who had ever noticed the shape of the claws of any beast of prey could have answered the question without seeing an actual descent. Farmers' boys who have often seen cows and horses lie down and rise are seldom sure whether the animals rise with their fore or hind feet first, or whether the habit of the horse agrees with that of the cow in this respect. The elm tree has about its leaf a peculiarity which all ought to notice the first time they see it, and yet only about five percent of a certain school could incorporate in a drawing this peculiarity, although it is so easily outlined on paper. Perception, to achieve satisfactory results, must summon the will to its aid to concentrate the attention. Only the smallest part of what falls upon our senses at any time is actually perceived. The way to train the mind to receive clear sight impressions, and therefore to retain them in the memory, is simply to concentrate the will and attention upon objects of sight, endeavoring to see them plainly and distinctly, and then to practice recalling the details of the object some time afterward. It is astonishing how rapidly one may improve in this respect by a little practice, and it is amazing how great a degree of proficiency in this practice one may attain in a short time. You have doubtless heard the story of Houdin, the French conjurer, who cultivated his memory of sight impressions by following a simple plan. He started into practice by observing the number of small objects in the Paris shop windows he could see and remember in one quick glance as he rapidly walked past the window. He followed the plan of noting down on paper the things that he saw and remembered. At first he could remember but two or three articles in the window. Then he began to see and remember more, and so on, each day adding to his power of perception and memory, until finally he was able to see and remember nearly every small article in a large shop window, after bestowing but one glance upon it. Others have found this plan an excellent one, and have developed their power of perception greatly, and at the same time, cultivated an amazingly retentive memory of objects thus seen. It is all a matter of use and practice. The experiment of Houdin may be varied infinitely with excellent results. The Hindus train their children along these lines by playing the sight game with them. This game is played by exposing to the sight of the children a number of small objects at which they gaze intently, and which are then withdrawn from their sight. The children then endeavor to excel each other in writing down the names of the objects which they have seen. The number of objects is small to begin with, but is increased each day until an astonishing number are perceived and remembered. 
Rudyard Kipling, in his great book Kim, gives an instance of this game, played by Kim and a trained native youth. Lurgan Sahib exposes to the sight of the two boys a tray filled with jewels and gems, allowing them to gaze upon it a few moments before it is withdrawn from sight. Then the competition begins as follows. There are, under that paper, five blue stones, one big, one smaller, and three small, said Kim in all haste. There are four green stones and one with a hole in it. There is one yellow stone that I can see through, and one like a pipe stem. There are two red stones and... and give me time. But Kim had reached the limit of his powers. Then came the turn of the native boy. Hear my count, cried the native child. First are two flawed sapphires, one of two ratis and one of four, as I should judge. The four rati sapphire is chipped at the edge. There is one Turkestan turquoise, plain with green veins, and there are two inscribed, one with the name of God in gilt, and the other being cracked across, for it came out of an old ring I cannot read. We have now the five blue stones, four flamed emeralds there are, but one is drilled in two places, and one is a little carven. Their weight, said Lurgan Sahib, impassively. Three, five, five, and four ratis, as I judge it. There is one piece of old greenish amber and a cheap cut topaz from Europe. There is one ruby of Burma, one of two ratis, without a flaw. And there is a balas ruby, flawed, of two ratis. There is a carved ivory from China, representing a rat sucking an egg. And there is last, aha, a ball of crystal as big as a bean set in gold leaf. Kim is mortified at this bad beating and asks the secret. The answer is, by doing it many times over till it is done perfectly, for it is worth doing. Many teachers have followed plans similar to that just related. A number of small articles are exposed and the pupils are trained to see and remember them, the process being gradually made more and more difficult. A well-known American teacher was in the habit of rapidly making a number of dots on the blackboard and then erasing them before the pupils could count them in the ordinary way. The children then endeavored to count their mental impressions, and before long they could correctly name the number up to ten or more with ease. They said they could see six or see ten, as the case may be, automatically and apparently without the labor of consciously counting them. It is related in works dealing with the detection of crime that in the celebrated thieves schools in Europe, the young thieves are trained in a similar way, the old scoundrels acting as teachers exposing a number of small articles to the young ones and requiring them to repeat exactly what they had seen. Then follows a higher course in which the young thieves are required to memorize the objects in a room, the plan of houses, etc. They are sent forth to spy out the land for future robberies, in the guise of beggars soliciting alms, and thus getting a rapid peep into houses, offices, and stores. It is said that in a single glance they will perceive the location of all of the doors, windows, locks, bolts, etc. Many nations have boys' games in which the youngsters are required to see and remember after taking a peep. The Italians have a game called Moro, in which one boy throws out a number of fingers, which must be instantly named by the other boy, a failure resulting in a forfeit. The Chinese youths have a similar game, while the Japanese boys reduce this to a science. 
A well-trained Japanese youth will be able to remember the entire contents of a room after one keen glance around it. Many of the Orientals have developed this faculty to a degree almost beyond belief. But the principle is the same in all cases, the gradual practice and exercise, beginning with a small number of simple things, and then increasing the number and complexity of the objects. The faculty is not so rare as one might imagine at first thought. Take a man in a small business and let him enter the store of a competitor and see how many things he will observe and remember after a few minutes in the place. Let an actor visit a play in another theater and see how many details of the performance he will notice and remember. Let some women pay a visit to a new neighbor and then see how many things about that house they will have seen and remembered to be retailed to their confidential friends afterward. It is the old story of attention following the interest and memory following the attention. An expert whist player will see and remember every card played in the game and just who played it. A chess or checker player will see and remember the previous moves in the game, if he be expert, and can relate them afterward. A woman will go shopping and will see and remember thousands of things that a man would never have seen, much less remembered. As Houdin said, Thus, for instance, I can safely assert that a lady seeing another pass at full speed in a carriage will have had time to analyze her toilet from her bonnet to her shoes and be able to describe not only the fashion and quality of the stuffs, but also say if the lace be real or only machine-made. I have known ladies to do this. But remember this, for it is important. Whatever can be done in this direction by means of attention, inspired by interest, may be duplicated by attention directed by will. In other words, the desire to accomplish the task adds and creates an artificial interest just as effective as the natural feeling. 